The, um, so I was originally built to talk about something about the difference. What I'm actually wanting to talk about is um, bringing private firms into the finance African infrastructure. And this is something that um, emerged out of the, uh, the last G8, which I was an advisor for. And this was one of the items on the G8 agenda. The G8 countries committed to take this forward. Uh, and last month we had a, uh, a workshop at the British Academy uh, bringing about 50 top level private finance people together with senior policy people. So here's, the, here's why the topic matters. Uh, and it, it's a contrast between a, a sort of opportunity uh, and, 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 a, and a crisis. And the, the opportunity is, um, is that Africa needs um, thus the more uh, expenditure on infrastructure than its current cost. The sort of estimates of something like $40 billion a year more infrastructure investment is needed across Africa. $40 billion. It's a huge amount. you get to take over the course of a decade or so African infrastructure up to, uh, to the sort of levels that would provide uh, a decent base for private investment. After all, private investment to public investment are competence. We so have just come from Ethiopia, um, where um, the, uh, the Ethiopian government has uh, got, a, got a new plan which basically tries to do East Asian investment rates. So it's a big push investment strategy. And, and the challenge is that, like the rest of Africa, uh, Ethiopia has Africa-level savings rates. And so there's a gap between East Asian investment rates and African savings rates. Now, the response of the IMF to the Ethiopian uh, big push investment plan is basically to say we shouldn't do it. But if you try to do that using domestic resources, it would crowd out private investment. Um, and uh, we, won't, uh, we won't let you uh, go to international markets to buy it. This would breach your various commitments under debt relief. And I think both of those responses are actually wrong. Um, in Ethiopia, there isn't that much private investment to crowd out at the moment. And one major reason is that the infrastructure situation is so poor. For example, as in the rest of Africa, it's just a of electricity. Um, whether Africa can raise foreign finance to fill the gap depends upon the, the architecture of, uh, of designing basically a series of commitment technologies. So there's the opportunity, there's this, this need for about $40 million, billion dollars a year uh, an investment in infrastructure that would have a decent rate of return. Some of the estimated rates of return are spectacular, but even if we talk about sort of high single digit uh, rates of return, that's a respectable return. And then we come to the crisis, and the crisis is in uh, OECD pension funds. Uh, OECD pension funds are basically uh, liabilities which have been built up on the presumption of reasonable positive rates of return. And that presumption has collapsed. And the current risk-free real rate of return on assets in the OECD is, to a first approximation, zero. Uh, and so uh, pension funds, insurance companies, uh, face well, it's basically a quiet crisis. They have liabilities built on the presumption of rates of return which are no longer available within the OECD. And if we look across the Eurozone, uh, the return to decent rates of return don't look uh, an imminent prospect. So, um, here's, the, here's the opportunity, is to marry 
the, uh, the needs of $40 billion worth of investment in African infrastructure, which will yield quite decent rates of return, with the need of OECD financial portfolios to get from zero to respectable returns. And yet that hasn't happened. Until two years ago, uh, it hadn't happened at all. So if I'd been giving this talk two years ago, it would have seemed like complete romantic nonsense uh, because uh, OECD private financial sector just would not touch African infrastructure. Now, now in the last two years, there's been more activity, more deals than in the previous 20. So it was, it was suddenly and quite rapidly off the bottom. Uh, but we're nowhere near getting to, uh, to major financial firms. So why is that? Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, most of my talk is going to be organized around a series of solutions. Uh, and implicitly or explicitly, as I go to each solution, I'll sketch the problem to which it is a solution. Uh, but I'm going to start by just characterizing the typical infrastructure project as having three phases. Um, it's a planning phase, if you like. Um, not just technical planning, but the whole sort of political process of catalyzing a, a project. Um, and that, that process can take many, many years. Um, the second phase is for that minority of plans that actually cease to be dreams and start to be implemented, you actually have to build something. And that build phase might take typically about four years. Um, and then there's a final phase which is operate the infrastructure, which goes on for decades. Um, now, in attracting private finances, I think it's useful to unbundle infrastructure into these three phases. It's very, very difficult to get private finance interested in that first phase. The reason is it's just too slow. It's very slow, and uh, many prospective projects fail for reasons completely outside the control of the private sector. The politics changes and what seemed a good idea is no longer a good idea or is vetoed by some, by some party. Um, if I give an example of, a, of a, an electricity generating project in Ghana, uh, Ghana being about the most uh, advanced of the, of the African economies advanced politically as well. Um, this was done by a, a, a sort of public private partnership to try and get it to from a, from a plan to the market. And it took eight years. Now, no team from an investment bank uh, is going to look at something that takes eight years. The costs uh, facing investment banks, the time horizon is such that that is just a complete thing. Um, so either you have to speed these things up, or you have just engaged the private sector at the latest step. Um, how could you speed them up? Well, one way is to try and standardize uh, projects. Um, so, for example, uh, Every African country needs uh, private electricity power generation. Uh, a legal document uh, for a, an off-peak agreement in for Kenya recently, private generation. The legal document was a thousand pages long. Now, just imagine the legal costs of digesting that document to see whether you wanted to invest in this project. The, 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 
the, the cost of information by such an idiosyncratic projects is prohibited. Um, whereas uh, in other countries, in Asia, you can get off-take agreements where the legal document is 20 pages. So I think the right approach is to standardize wherever possible. A good vehicle for that would be something like the African government, with whom we're in touch. Um, so they could use standardized agreements. That approach was to an extent tried by the IFC, the International Finance Corporation. And in fact, there was a standardized agreement that nobody did it. Um, but that's of course, there are a lot of other impediments which I'll come to shortly. Um, and solving one problem alone, this is the weakest link problem. Um, and so standardized agreements only make sense in the context of a lot of deal flow. If you're doing one agreement and it's standardized, it's still as idiosyncratic as every other one down. And that's what I have seen face. It did one standardized agreement, which sort of by definition is a standardized agreement. Now, so one solution to this very long and variable um, preparatory stage is standardization. And another is to build um, specialist teams that catalyze the process. And the catalytic process is primarily not technical, it's political. And you're just starting to see the emergence in the private sector of international teams headed by very high profile uh, former politicians or people who operated very closely with politicians who then have the convening power um, to work with an African president and his government and keep unblocking the veto points. So it's that combination of very high level political um, catalysis and standardization that may get that process that, that process isn't big enough the planning stage. Um, but it is very big risk. And the main risk is the debate. Then if we turn to the second stage, build. That is the phase which is both high risk and very big money. Uh, building a power station, building a hydro dam. This is big money. Uh, and uh, there are serious risks of project overrun and project delay. Many of those risks being outside the control of the private uh, of, of the company. So that phase, I think, will be very hard for the private sector to take the leading role in terms of risk bearing and cash. Uh, so that's the phase which needs either domestic risk bearing capital or better international risk bearing capital, public risk bearing capital. So that's the phase which organizations like IFC, CDC, such like FMO, that's the phase that they should be financing. Um, that's the phase that the Ethiopians are trying to finance themselves. They're building dams. Uh, because there's global NGO lobbies against that, um, the, the public financial organizations won't touch it. Um, so they have to finance it themselves. It's with the third stage, which is operating uh, infrastructure, where there is the risks are much lower. But once the thing is up and running, the risks are a lot lower. Uh, indeed, in the OECD, uh, owning a functioning electricity company is classified as a utility and is seen as a very boring investment suitable for the boring end of a pension fund's portfolio. 
Whereas if you take that same electricity generation and put it in Ghana instead of in Portugal, it switches from being a boring utility to a frontier investment. And so the expected rate of return rockets. Uh, an OECD boring utility, you'd be looking at mid-single mid digit returns. Um, the, um, the Ghana electricity generating project that I already mentioned to you um, struggled to find the private finance, even when it was up and running, with a 20% yield. So, splitting these things up, unbundling a project to the, the catalytic phase, the bills phase, which is public risk capital, and the run phase, uh, which is potentially um, the sort of thing that pension funds so could, could do, uh, that seems step one is unbundled. Next uh, possible solution is to bring in um, insurance, and especially political risk insurance. And the institutions for that exist, they're just um, ridiculously small. Um, the key institution here is NIGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agreement of the World Bank. And until recently, NIGA um, did practically no business in Africa. It's just been a, a, a former uh, chief operating officer of the African region of the World Bank has just been brought in and it's quadrupled its Africa portfolio in a year, uh, which doesn't tell you that opportunities have suddenly increased. It tells you that the mission of the organization has changed. Uh, uh, and the, the heart of the problem was that neither recruited, because it was an insurance Guess who had recruited people from insurance companies? And what did they do? Um, they basically thought, well, we're an insurance company, let's look for really safe things that we can insure so that we don't have to pay anything out. Um, in other words, they just uh, cherry picked and um, became a sort of privileged private insurance company. Whereas the whole point of a public agency doing political risk insurance is that it's a development strategy. And so NEPA needs to be done first and foremost, not as an insurance company, but as a complementary development strategy for a development program. And indeed, here is the punchline. NEGA, although NEGA thinks of itself as an insurance company, actually it isn't. Nearly everything that NEGA pays out as a claim, it manages to recover from governments. In Africa, I think there's been no payout that it hasn't been funded. And so what media really is, is a disguised form of commitment technology on the part of African governments. By accepting that a project be insured with media, they're basically committing uh, to pay. Um, and of course it's dressed up as insurance, it's not an affront to sovereignty. That's why NEGA can ensure at very low, low rates. You can get five classes of political risk insurance for a premium of only 1% per year on the amount insured. So uh, if you go back to your, um, the, the, this electricity generation project in Ghana, um, private investors were looking for 20%. Um, 1% of that could be completely you get you can remove all the non-commercial risks. And what you're left with is a utility in a country that's been growing at between 7 and 10 percent a year. In other words, this is a pretty safe sort of investment. Now, so what we really need to do is to scale legal up massively. And the tragedy is that organizations like MEGA and IFC have been viewed as little adjunct of, of the World Bank, um, which can be run profitably so as to cross-subsidize the aid operation of the World Bank. So each year they pay a premium to the aid operation. 
Whereas what the World Bank of the Future should be is recognizing that its core functions are public risk capital and de-risking through, uh, through insurance. And so this is a very good use for it. Instead of the money flowing from MEGA and IFC into IDA, the work the, the aid arm of the bank, it should flow in the other way. A very good use of aid in, a, in an emerging African country will be to pay the political risk premium on private investment. And yet, although they're within the same group, as as they put up the World Bank group, they're treated as three completely sealed corporations where the private stuff is supposed to cross subsidize. <coughs> um, commitment technologies. Um, commitment technologies are hugely important um, in African infrastructure investment because um, they are just infrastructure investments that just repeat <coughs> the opportunities for hold up. You sink a lot of private capital uh, irreversibly, and governments have a myriad of opportunities uh, to, uh, to, 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 to extract your profit, basically. And that has to be protected against. Our best bet is, 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 is legal, but it's, but it's only one of the approaches. Coming to the, the operating phase of utilities, um, the, the return on operation obviously depends upon the quality of management. And a, a very striking feature is, uh, of utility management is that in the OECD uh, there are now, to a large extent, utilities are being privatised. So there are a lot of, um, of private sector utility operators throughout the OECD. And the first approximation, they don't operate in Africa at all, except on field of those headlines where they're very successful. Um, and, uh, and that is a big um, missed opportunity, trying to, to coax um, OECD utility operators to go and operate utilities in Africa, because that would be part of the commitment technology uh, of reassuring private investors that they would get a decent return. Now, one big impediment to getting uh, utility companies to operate in Africa is that because utilities are network industries, um, you always need a regulator. And regulators need discretion, uh, and you can't do discretion in environments with a reputation for high levels of corruption. Uh, and that, that is the sort of killer problem. Uh, that uh, regulators need discretion, discretion opens the door to corruption, um, and that means that, public, that, that private utility operators will be very wary of going into these markets. What's the solution to that? Well, not only are there a lot of private utility companies in the OECD, there are now a lot of independent regulators and they are usually set up in such a way that they could operate internationally. And so they could sell regulatory services, or at a minimum, they could twin with regulatory agencies in Africa, so as to try and ensure decent standards. Um, the final um, hurdle is, is financial regulation within the OECD. And there are some curiosities here that um, limit um, a lot of pension funds from holding African assets. Um, the, um, 
Some pension funds now do hold African infrastructure assets, but very, very few. The, the, the one that's always cited is the Canadian Teachers Pension Fund. So, uh, so Canadian teachers are uh, 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 I'll give you one example of, a, of an anomaly of regulation, and that is that uh, we uh, legally require pension funds to hold assets um, that have particular, that have at least particular uh, ratings, A rates, such like investment rating. And the ratings for those, uh, those ratings come from the commercial rating agencies. So it's a very unusual situation where a law uh, gives power to the judgments of a private, the private organizations, the rating agencies. It's very unusual. Um, and it has to be said that it's not as if the risk rating agencies have um, demonstrated um, exceptional competence over the last decade. They've actually demonstrated astounding incompetence. Um, if they were narrowly rated as AAA um, investments that, uh, that, that, that very recommend that, that, that they sound. Um, in Africa, we have the opposite problem with the risk rating agencies. The risk rating agencies are new. <coughs> so they're very, very cautious. Uh, so just as they were reluctant <coughs> to downgrade big companies that were heading for bankruptcy, um, they're reluctant to upgrade um, oh. African companies. Um, they also have a, a, a glass ceiling, which they operate in Africa, but they don't operate in the OECD. And this is a very important glass ceiling. The, and the glass ceiling, which applies for Africa, is that no project in Africa can be rated more highly than the sovereign bond. That doesn't apply in the OECD at all. Um, empirically, it's not borne out. Um, for example, Côte d'Ivoire, um, its sovereign bond went into default over the last decade with the uh, Civil War. Um, but the uh, power company kept on paying right through the system. And if you think about it, um, uh, ring fence projects have much better risk properties, or can be designed to have better risk properties than sovereign bonds. The plus factor with sovereign bonds is what's behind it, the entire tax base. The minus side with sovereign bonds which is a pretty big minus, is that everybody else in the whole country is competing for that tax base. And you have no privileged access to it as a sovereign bond holder. Whereas with ring fence approaches, you sacrifice some of the tax base, but you have privileged access to the stuff, to the revenues within the ring fence. So it's possible to design things combined with meager insurance and um, OECD utility operator uh, reassurance um, that can make those ring fence operations um, really quite, uh, quite secure. Let me close with a, um, with a couple of remarks on, um, on interdependence. And the first is interdependence of infrastructure activities. Um, the typical approach of the World Bank, forgive me, I'm as much a part of the World Bank as I am. The typical approach of the World Bank of infrastructure um, has been to do cost benefit analysis of an infrastructure project, project by project. Um, now that's better than the president looking out of the window and saying, uh, let's build a down here, yeah. undoubtedly. But it's not really first best, because um, 
infrastructure is itself interdependent. Infrastructure is the sine qua non of a lot of modern economic activity. If you don't have a network of infrastructure, you won't get the private assets. It's very, very constrained. And so, in many ways, the right approach to evaluating infrastructure is to think, if, you, if, if this country wants to get to middle income level, what typically is the sort of infrastructure it's going to be? Rather than take this railway line and try and evaluate this railway line in isolation and do a cost-benefit analysis, which is inevitably conditional on the present level of the capita income, the better approach is to, is to say, okay, but this country, somehow, we're going to get into middle income. It's going to get to middle income. If it gets to middle income, what set of infrastructure will it need? That's what has to be paid for. That's what has to be done. Uh, I'll say, I've just come from Ethiopia, which doesn't have a railway. It's a landlocked country without a functioning railway line or port. It's a landlocked country that is very high, huge rainfall, with a huge uh, uh, kinetic energy in the, in the water run, and yet it's desperately short of the electricity. And so it, it doesn't really need a cost benefit to know that Ethiopia is going to have to have a functioning railway to a port. It's going to have to harness that kinetic energy from water to generate electric power. And so we don't need the IMF to tell us we shouldn't do it. We need a lot of work to think of the financial infrastructure that will make both the railway of electricity and the road network possible. And just Picking each infrastructure project in isolation and trying to, to tell us that given the present level of economic activity in Ethiopia, a railway will pay for itself. Given the present level of activity, the road network will pay for itself, and such forth. And this is the point. But this is a country of 90 million people that has to be got to middle income. And for a middle income country of 90 million people that's landlocked. It will need a rent and so forth. So, interdependence of infrastructure activities. Um, and the final point is interdependence of the solutions. As I indicated, it's no use introducing standardization of projects if you've only got one project. And so these solutions are interdependent. That is why they've not been cracked. The private sector is very good at cracking problems where there is a single impediment with a single solution. Because then the return on achieving that solution is very high for the private sector. What the private sector is incapable of doing is where there are multiple impediments, each with a requiring a solution which is totally unconnected with some other solution. If you need to change the rules about how rating agencies are permitted to, uh, to, to, to impose this glass ceiling, that's something that will be done uh, in OECD financial regulation authorities. Completely disconnected from what MEGA might be doing, and so on and so forth. <coughs> That's why you need a high-level political push. So the, the strategy we've got, that's my last remark, the strategy we've got is first to do the academic work in association with the private sector to try and identify what the various impediments are, and then use the OECD and the African Development Bank as vehicles to create the political momentum for this, and then finally, for them, OECD and African Development Bank, to take this to the G20. So, thank you very much.
discuss uh, both uh, in the end. So I, since Paul didn't uh, use slides, I'm actually going to put his presentation in some slides. So um, we'll both have it by saying that Africa needs far more infrastructure uh, than its government, government can afford through taxes or through uh, a so basically, Paul presented us with a combination of private and public uh, initiatives. So, still part of the diagnosis is this idea that foreign aid, uh, it's a decade of foreign aid directed for infrastructure. And there is this clear, um, clear uh, view that we don't have nowadays that corruption uh, is a problem, and so uh, international institutions are afraid of it. Private sector in the OECD countries uh, is disengaged due to a set of reasons that Paul mentioned. Um, so there is, of course, this idea of the political risk uh, in the context of incomplete contracts. Uh, there is the idea that the private sector cannot really uh, take advantage of externalities. Uh, there is also this idea that Africa is too small for investment in very specific knowledge. Uh, Paul uh, also mentioned this idea of uh, standardization um, as a problem uh, that can only, only be solved by large players. And then there is the regulation problems in uh, home countries. So, Paul then uh, mentioned a set of possible solutions. Uh, first of all, uh, this idea of specialist teams, including technical knowledge, but also uh, political entrepreneurship. And, and you've been enforced a lot at this point. So basically, this idea of political entrepreneurship to overcome the point. This political entrepreneurship is unlikely to be present in conventional private venture capital um, firms. Then, Paul mentioned this idea of standardization. Markets are bad at uh, self generating uh, standardization. Um, for instance, the African Development Bank uh, is a good possibility since it is uh, African-based in the provider of infrastructure finance. Paul mentioned then uh, the idea of decreasing risk uh, by increasing insurance, and namely through MIGA, for uh, political and currency risks. Also, this idea of bundling by splitting projects in phases and bundling uh, together projects from different countries. Then this idea of commitment technologies. So there are significant uh, opportunities for hold-up uh, from governments, and so something uh, should be uh, done about this. So uh, basically commitment can come through dispute resolution boards, um, agreed between, between African governments and, and private contractors, but it can also be uh, coming from multilaterals and large bilaterals. Paul mentioned then this idea of uh, using the knowledge of OECD utility operators, they have the specialist, the specialist teams and organizational structures needed for good governance, they have a reputation to defend. The final, in the final part of Paul, Paul's presentation, Paul um, mentioned this idea of uh, financial regulation and specifically some uh, rules that are in place that are maybe uh, they, that, that should be changed. There's this rule is sealing, plus sealing this rule by uh, rating agencies that an African project cannot be rated more highly uh, than the sovereign debt of, of the country. Um, of the corresponding country, this is not applicable to OECD. There are quite different structures of risk between sovereign debt and uh, infrastructure. Finally, um, Paul also mentioned uh, that sound regulation is needed. Infrastructure is typically a local or national monopoly and so subject to regulation. Regulation sets obligations to supply disadvantaged and remote customers. So one approach is to draw on the experience of OECD regulators uh, advising, overseeing, and undertaking regulation of infrastructure projects in Africa. 
Finally, uh, Paul mentioned the idea of inter inter interdependence of, uh, of solutions um, and also seeing these infrastructure projects as part of a uh, larger development strategy where development agencies can help. So let me add some thoughts to what Paul said. So first of all, let me mention, uh, I think Paul mentioned this in, in, his, uh, in his writings, but um, so there is this idea that the Chinese model, so it seems like international development agencies have come the Chinese way to a certain extent. Uh, it is at least not the manner it was some years ago um, when people saw this Chinese model as distorting conditionality and the same is for good, good governance, which may still be a point, of course. Um, but still, uh, this Chinese model is certainly not perfect. Uh, and a lot of, not today, but a lot of what Paul uh, says in, uh, in other work, um, well, actually, typically, the Chinese model does not involve local resources. And so, uh, basically, the Chinese bring basically even uh, human resources. And so, uh, there is certainly space for improvement on this model. Um, of course, involving local human resources in infrastructure building. Uh, basically, it's an enormous opportunity for learning by doing improvements in human capital. So, the sort of thing is there space for uh, competition conducive to uh, development uh, improvements, competition on this uh, Chinese model. Then uh, Paul emph emphasized a lot uh, the role of development agencies. Uh, I think we all uh, I think understand this need for specialist knowledge, international coordination, political pressure. Uh, international development agencies certainly have um, all these. But still, uh, development agencies nowadays give the impression of significant rigidity. Okay, so just maybe uh, I have already mentioned this idea of corruption, not that corruption is of course a good thing, but uh, maybe uh, they are too afraid of corruption. So just to give you an example from a very recent experience that I had, uh, basically uh, I was involved in, in this uh, in a World Bank project in a Portuguese speaking African country, and basically for a simple impact evaluation project in which we were involved in schools, uh, it took like two years uh, over process um, to be uh, finished. So uh, can they, to a certain extent, these development agencies, can they really compete with the Chinese? So related to that, can we really have uh, private sector based specialist teams with political power to overcome the two points? And that's really one of one of the big points that Paul raised. Um, there are some experiences with different uh, sponsored organizations, this is private infrastructure development group, still in the, be in the very beginning. Um, and of course, our prior research is that these are probably uh, effective for some countries where DFID has real influence, but what about countries uh, with, for instance, significant natural resources, and so less dependent on uh, bilaterals. So we see more and more southern uh, oil investments, for instance, in Angola, Mozambique, um, uh, from uh, Brazil or China. So, again, is OECD losing the <coughs> So, finally, uh, let me make this point on, um, it's, to a certain extent, it's unclear whether we can really trust governments in, in the average uh, fragile state. Uh, or, to say it in another way, uh, or that conditionality uh, is that strong an instrument from uh, aid organizations. Again, this is particularly the case for countries in doubt with significant natural resources. Hence, investment is still conditional uh, on broader development strategies. So, I think that's, that's probably uh, an important way uh, to still think about uh, this limitation of conditionality. And so, including the institutional and political development, which is extremely, uh, I 
deeply believe that uh, improving institutions is, is extremely important for, for development and uh, the employment of natural resources for development, investing by investment, another of Paul's big message um, from his work. So I think to a certain extent that, that is also an implicit message uh, in Paul's thoughts today about uh, infrastructure and finance infrastructure. <coughs> so let's have um, Interesting session again, even though I may not have the sound. Um, I was disappointed that you didn't uh, talk about remittances. I mean, this is so much part of the Portuguese way of remembering itself and others. My first research paper. But anyway, um, I, 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 I kind of want to put the global view that you presented into a, a European, specifically European, perhaps Eurozone setup, because there are, just uh, came from a conference where they were trying to use uh, German savings, even the preference of German savers in their abundance into very unsophisticated instrument for Greek and what you're doing is more global because you're trying to get Asian savings to African investment. And I, I mean this to be encouraged because, of course, what people were saying was from the financial industry was that this was extremely difficult and it was just trying to get people to focus on that. And so uh, just don't give up because, because everybody is, is, is doing it. Uh, but the effects are not quite evident. And you gave some examples. Struck me most is, of course, the tragedy of Negan. And uh, I mean, it's again part of the civil thinking in government agencies, and you discuss and mention that as well. I have two points that I'd like to, to dispute. One is this idea that you mentioned, in fact, more than once, that utilities in the OECD are boring. Well, no, they were before Lehman, perhaps, and many other things, but now they got one of the largest fall in total return because of the crisis, in part because of the technology, but also because of regulation. So it's far from a tranquil industry in the OECD, and perhaps I might say more so in Europe, because of course we see the US becoming an exuberant um, uh, energy um, producer and with the price that cannot be uh, beat. This is the case, perhaps a European. But I think, given the proximity, as we uh, like to say, between Europe and Africa, and uh, um, the examples that you yourself gave, that, that's more than. Uh, it, it's also perhaps a continental European. I mean, you may you may have a British view there uh, for a change. Um, the other one is this idea that you know, again the silos of the DAC and the fact that there are new aid providers that don't want to join the DAC. Um, but uh, in the case of, of, of China, just returned from Angola, and uh, in the case of China, what is striking is the lack, and I think you mentioned this, is the lack of hands-on experience. I mean, even at the most basic uh, uh, level, the fact that the workers are coming but do not interact in the least with the local population sets a very strong limit on the up up, uh, on the scaling down. So even if the model in itself is, is perfect, uh, implementation is very difficult. So some research uh, we've done here um, uh, comparing uh, uh, foreign direct investment with, uh, of Chinese firms and OECD firms didn't show the differences you would expect about corruption and the, it, it only showed Chinese investment didn't care so much about the openness of the economy and cared rather more about the growth prospects. But, I mean, the big difference, 
it's really that successful European or OECD, let's say, classical investment by private firms, and this is why you call for quite rightly for uh, utilities to have more in Africa, and they do, but again, they are uh, a little scared. But the point is, again, the local knowledge, and, and that ties in with uh, what was said at the beginning, uh, you know, how BPI itself kind of tried to get into the local scene very much in banking. Well, that seems to be easier than in infrastructure. Uh, beginning to raise what other stuff. We have another question here. Because uh, I teach a course in project finance in, um, here at the university, and I do some consulting as well. And um, so I, um, I'd like to make a couple of uh, comments to uh, Mr. Palmer's um, presentation. Uh, you mentioned the word big risky. I basically I prohibited my, I forbade my students from using that word because I don't think it can be risk. What you have to do is really, you learn to analyze and underwrite the risk in a very selective manner. So uh, I just, uh, but it's a very, it's a very popular word. I think it's an illusion. So uh, I just wanted to underline that, just in case any of my students are here, uh, and so they would, uh, they would uh, hear that. Uh, then I, I, I totally agree with the specialized students. I think those uh, really work. Um, I'm uh, actually on the board of a company, of an infrastructure fund, which is part of PITCH, uh, which is a cooperative of the European Development Finance Agencies. Uh, well, not even just European, I think there's some uh, non-European, and that really works. And um, uh, they, but one of the things that works there is that they have uh, explicit involvement with local banks. They, they even have a company called Garand Coast that provides risk guarantees for local funding. And that is, that's why it works. So we need about 10 pitches. Uh, we need lots more of that. Uh, so I was very, very glad that the percent brought that up. I think that's really worthwhile. Now, I would uh, say that um, I see, where I see this going is that we need much smaller projects, more replicable. So with emphasis on small, standardized, with replication. So I will give you an example. Um, we talked about, about hydroelectric dams. Uh, in some countries, they have immense um, capacity and potential. So they're building these huge hydroelectric dams, even though, and they're talking about building more and more, even though they're export-oriented, sometimes in one country, 40% of the, of the electricity just disappears the way it disappears in other sectors, like uh, just in other sectors. And so it's, it's not invoiced, it's not collected. And then the, the, the connection rate uh, of the local population is the less than 20%. Less than 20% have. So you have this, uh, you have this uh, big electricity export with less than 20% of this population connected to the grid. So, what are we doing when we're financing these big, huge investment projects with, um, you know, with all the de-risking that you might imagine? That we're not really even contributing to outcomes, or not even to outputs for the local population, much less outcomes. So I think that um, uh, uh, it's all about local development, local knowledge, involving the local, working with local banks, and uh, that's how you can finance development both the profitably and in a sustainable and effective manner.
they are um, the same ones that um, present the bottlenecks with which the African develop, uh, developing countries uh, have to deal with afterwards. In China, I'm glad you spoke about China because uh, China at the end of the day presents a direct link between the infrastructural uh, networks and the economic networks that they offer to these African countries which end up being their clients. So this is an advantage. Um, and the, se the second thing is that um, the sorry, I just lost track of my what I was going to say. Ah, the second thing I was going to propose is that these infrastructure projects, instead of uh, I'm not saying to act more like China in terms of disclosing their um, the economic interests, but they should also. Um, you talked about creating an infrastructure network. But it's also not to limit yourself to the infrastructure network itself, but also to the economic network that revolves around it. For example, I was working in Ethiopia last year, and we were doing an assessment of the Af uh, agricultural development land industrial industrialization. And they were building dams all over the place. And in a country where most of the plots are of a very small scale, the, um, the dam was not a very well thought through project, I would say, for the, for the framework in which the country operates in practical terms. And the third um, comment I would like to make is that sustainability of the investors should not limit itself to the financial sustainability of the projects they finance, but also sustainability in terms of inclusion and usage of the beneficiaries. Um, the sponsors, the investors should work, should make a good governance and capacity building a condition instead of just making the repayment um, a condition, for example. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll not speak for very long. Um, China, yes, and should. The paper discusses China, but I didn't come at all. Um, um, one aspect of China is, the, is that it's fast. Um, the, the World Bank and other agencies have just become incredibly slow. They, they've been, become very cumbersome because they've jammed up with. Um, uh, the conditions imposed by NGOs, basically. We've just got, we've just got this accumulation of uh, environmental and social um, uh, requirements which, which impose spectacularly long delays on projects. Meanwhile, the actual decision of the rights to the typical African government is shortened because they're now all subject to election cycles. And so uh, the, the, the length of a typical World Bank project, even in preparation, now runs beyond the election cycle. Whereas the Chinese fly and say, as the president, we can do this in your term of office. Um, and, uh, and so the, 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 the official procedures have to be changed to be benchmarked on the genuine competition, which is China. And they simply have to be made faster. Um, I discussed this with the World Bank president, and he said, well, there is, unfortunately, there's no appetite whatsoever um, in my board um, for uh, weakening or revisiting any of these environmental and social requirements. Um, and that is the problem, that NGOs are the only groups, organized groups that are interested in these things, and they've had a very, very biased perspective um, on, the, on the costs and benefits. Um, the big Chinese innovation was to come up with a, a credible commitment technology, which was the link between um, uh, the infrastructure and the natural resources. And that's not a foolish approach. Um, so, uh, there are 
several routes to connect with technologies, but basically the Chinese invented a very good one. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's a sensible one to copy. Um, the problem with the Chinese in this space is at the moment they're the only ones doing it. So they're the monopolists. And as all monopolists, they're getting a grip off returns for it. Um, I very much agree with the sort of the China-Europe contrast that, in effect, um, Europe knows too much about Africa, and China knows, China definitely knows too little. I was just in China in November, I was brought in to sort of advise the Chinese on Africa, basically. Um, they definitely know too little, there's no question. Um, in a sense, Europe knows too much. It's been involved in Africa for such a long time that it's become rather cynical. It insists on seeing cycles where sometimes there's takeoff. Uh, and this is where the sort of Brazils of this world have an advantage. Because Brazil goes in and says, ah, this is ours 40, 50 years ago. So they see takeoff. Whereas the typical European company goes in and says, oh yeah, we've seen the ups before, they're always qualified. Uh, and finally, very much agree with the remark about smaller projects, and that's absolutely right. Um, the, um, a lot of the problems come just from projects being too big. Uh, and so, uh, so, so just splitting them, that's part of the idea of unbundling the projects by time. Um, but, but equally, you can just make them a lot.